So, okay, let's get into our lesson. We are continuing the Lord's uh, Sermon on the Mount. Now, one of the most important aspects of the Sermon on the Mount to bear in mind when reading Jesus's message is to remember that the uh, Sermon on the Mount is about kingdom living. There's indeed no other text in scripture uh, that illuminates our understanding of what it means to follow Christ more than the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus describes what it means to live as a Christian. So this is why he took time in the beginning to describe the attributes of the kingdom person in the Beatitudes. And this is why he took time uh, to describe how his followers should interact with the world uh, when he talked about the salt and the light. Um, this is why he warned us, you know, we're going to be the savor and the light of the world, but they're still going to persecute us and hate us. And then this is why Jesus said, uh, lay down five principles uh, or kingdom ethics that would describe the character of those who want to follow Christ. And he put love at the heart of those virtues. So we are expected uh, then to possess this supernatural love that Jesus talked about uh, just previously in chapter 5. This is what characterizes every aspect of our life. Um, we took time to note this in particular because throughout all of his ethics in chapter 5 that he teaches, uh, love for God and love for others sits at the heart of each ethic. Um, and so he demonstrates to us that love is what characterizes a Christian. And this was what John the Apostle taught in his first epistle when he said, this is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. And so we see Jesus is describing an altogether unique and different way of life, a way of life that calls us even to love our enemies who the world might consider unlovable. Now, this is not going to be the focus of my sermon today. We are indeed going to focus on uh, the fasting section of the text, but this was laid on my heart that you really can't get to the spiritual disciplines and the fasting if you just sort of go over the character of Christian life, uh, especially as this is relevant today. Uh, I survey what I see as the Christian community um, online and in person in the, in the uh, uh, contact that I have with various people. And, and I see this as a really difficult time for us as Christians. Uh, it is a time that I think is challenging us but I want to take this opportunity uh, to admonish everyone at this point. We need to examine ourselves. And I've been doing a lot of this examination, this self-examination myself. And I see a lot of things in my own, uh, my own uh, speech, my own way of thinking that sometimes don't line up with the love that God has called us to. We remember this is Jesus' standard for you and I, how we're going to interact with this world. In Matthew 5, he says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. I want to emphasize this. This love is indeed a prerequisite to being a child of God. The idea is not that we must first possess this love in order to earn our way into his presence. Rather, the idea is that your encounter with Christ would so radically transform you that you would reflect this supernatural love. So I'll reiterate this. The times that we're in politically and in this society are times that are in a way like a refiner's fire. 
They will either prove your love or they will consume you. So because this sermon presents Jesus's message describing what it means to follow him in the kingdom of God, after having described the character that would uh, that his disciples would possess, we're going to focus on the third attribute, the third discipline that Jesus teaches, which again assumes a transformed life that is compelled by love. So you'll remember, what are the three disciplines that Jesus teaches? If you recall in your mind and you think about what we have seen in chapter 6, you'll recall that he teaches three specific disciplines. Number one, generosity. This is vital to nurturing the love that you have in your heart. This is how Christ's love in you grows. It takes hold of your heart and it becomes part of who you are. The second one is by far, in terms of verses written, his primary emphasis, and that's prayer. And we spent the last uh, probably a month, I think it was about a month, uh, on the Lord's Prayer uh, going through that. And that is vital to our spiritual life, to drawing near to God, um, and to fighting our spiritual warfare. This last one that we are in, uh, before we transition into the next phase of Jesus's uh, sermon, is fasting. And this is vital to cultivating self-control and, uh, a right, and right spiritual appetites. So let's go ahead and get into our text, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Uh, and these are three short verses. Uh, and I'll tell you, coming into this, I thought, man, this is going to be kind of hard to make a full uh, sermon out of just these three verses. So maybe I should, you know, combine them with something. And I'm really glad I didn't try that because now that I dug into this, there is so much content here. It's actually going to be very hard for us to cover all of it. So let's go ahead and read this text. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will <clears throat> reward you. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will talk about this text. Heavenly Father, I thank you for calling us here as your body in horseheads. I thank you for your sovereign will that has placed each person uh, where you would have them at this time, uh, that each one here you knew and you loved, and you called them into fellowship with your body to participate in the kingdom and, and uh, advancing this kingdom in this area. Father, I pray that you would uh, crucify my flesh, that your word would prevail, uh, that nothing of my agenda would stand in your way. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and teach us that you indeed are our shepherd and that you would shepherd us in these times that you would teach us to follow christ uh, not only faithfully but in a way that glorifies your son with the glory that he is worthy to receive uh, at, at, at all times in this area and beyond it's in jesus name that i pray amen verse 16 whenever you fast don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. So the first phrase that we encounter here is whenever you fast. Now, the first word in this sentence is actually important. You guys know I don't tend to like to get into a lot of the exegesis and the, the Greek and things of that nature, but this one is actually very important. It does help us, and, and I've seen some mistakes that happen here that I think uh, 
make it difficult to understand what Jesus wants to uh, uh, convey. So uh, this first word, the Greek word hotan, uh, describes an expectation that something will occur. And we've encountered this word multiple times. Hotan is the word translated whenever. In Matthew 5, 11, he says, you are blessed when they insult you. So remember that he's talking about our interaction with the world, and he says, you're going to be persecuted. But he tells us that when that happens, indeed, you will be blessed. Uh, again, in Matthew 6, 2, he says, so whenever you give to the poor, again, he's talking about the expectation that you will do something. So whenever uh, does not describe something as being optional, uh, but rather it describes the occurrence of something that does not have a prescribed frequency. Again, we see this uh, throughout the New Testament. So in Mark, when he's describing Jesus's interaction with the demons, what is the uh, response of the demons to Jesus? It says, whenever the uh, unclean spirits saw him, that's Christ, they fell down before him, cried out, you are the son of God. And all the way stretching to my favorite uh, discourses in the Bible, the throne room sequences in Revelation, it says, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, uh, they, they give him thanks and they, they worship him. So this describes a responsive action. That is our first point. When Jesus says, whenever you fast... He does not mean that whenever you want to fast, if you want to, it's totally up to you if you do or if you don't. That's inconsistent with the usage of this word. Rather, this word indicates uh, that fasting is a responsive action that, that we will voluntarily employ and practice throughout our life. So that is the first point we want to bring in. This is something that Jesus himself actually does expect his disciples to practice. Now, the next phrase that we have here is, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. Now, uh, one, you'll notice, one of the chief characteristics of Jesus' uh, series on spiritual disciplines is that he prefaces each one with a warning. So you remember with charity or generosity and with prayer, he said, hey, look, don't do this. This is what the hypocrites do. Uh, do this. And so he continues this, uh, this pattern when he speaks about fasting. As with both generosity and prayer, we discover that hypocrisy is the greatest threat to the spiritual integrity of fasting. I hope you'll recall that practicing things that are meant to be done as God-facing actions in order to be seen by people is Jesus's definition of hypocrisy here. These disciplines are God-seeking alone. To do them to earn people's uh, appreciation or respect is hypocritical. They are for God alone. The next uh, phrase that we get into, we see Jesus says, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Here, Jesus tells us how our hypocrisy is most likely to manifest when fasting. We will be tempted to put on display for everyone to see the inward struggle that we experience when fasting so that people will be impressed by how fervently we are seeking to be righteous. Jesus says this is what will corrupt and destroy your practice of fasting. The extent and scope of this kind of self-pleasing hypocrisy uh, is described in, in greater detail by Isaiah and his rebuke to Israel. So, in your Bibles, if you will turn with me to Isaiah 58, 1 through 4, 
Uh, you'll want to keep this one marked because we will return uh, about halfway through the sermon, and we'll look at the rest of this text. So uh, maybe towards the end of the sermon, I think. So Matt, uh, Isaiah 58, 1 through 4. In Isaiah's rebuke to Israel, they he is responding to their complaint that God doesn't hear them. They say, wait a minute, God's our God. We're his nation. Why, do, why doesn't he hear us? So that's what uh, Isaiah is responding to. Isaiah 58, 1 through 4. Cry out loudly. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a ram's horn. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. He wants to make known to them why he is not paying attention to their actions. Verse 2, they seek me day after day and delight to know my ways like a nation that does what is right and does not abandon the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted, but you have not seen? We have denied ourselves, but you don't. You haven't noticed. Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast and oppress all your workers. You fast with contention and strife to strike viciously with your fist. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. In this text, we can actually see the purposes of fasting assumed. You'll see that the first purpose in this uh, text about fasting is to seek God and his attention by denying ourselves and choosing him. You'll notice that God didn't correct their intent. He corrected their actions. The second purpose that we see in here, what is it? The second purpose is to delight in his ways. So first, seeking uh, fasting is to seek God. It's to seek him by denying ourselves specifically to choose him. Secondly, to delight in his ways. And then the third action that is described is to delight in his nearness. So there's an expectation that in fasting, God actually does draw near. Those who seek him in fasting, God actually does draw near. They seek him and they find him. And it is in this process of seeking God by denying ourselves to choose him, something happens. It's that second attribute that is described. We learn to delight in his ways. You see, fasting is one of the means by which we are able to uh, change our appetites and set our desires on God. We learn to crave and desire God in fasting. However, we can see that the manner in which they practiced fasting contradicted what their fasting sought to accomplish. The result was that they were frustrated because their fasting was without effect and God did not pay attention to them. Isaiah rebuked their hypocrisy saying, that their self-denial was a pretense. Indeed, they did as they wished. They were not actually denying themselves. They were putting up a pretense. So, in other words, it is possible for you to deny your physical urges for a hunger as a pretense. And that's exactly what they were doing. As well, he rebukes them by saying that their delight in God's ways was also a pretense. This was shown because though they professed to love God, they oppressed others and practiced strife. Does that sound at all familiar? Isaiah's message is clear. You cannot use fasting as a means to come to God when your heart and life are lived in defiance to him. So take time to consider these words. How many calls to fasting have we heard in our nation recently? 
Yet I wonder if God's response to us is the same as his response to Israel. You fast with contention and strife. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. This is why I started by reminding us of Jesus' supreme ethic for love. Reminding us of the basis in Jesus' own sermon, the ethics, the standards by which we are meant to live. These are what guide our practice of fasting. So in other words, if we fast, but we leave aside the ethics that he teaches, if we refuse to love our enemies and pray for those who hurt us, uh, we indeed invalidate the practice of fasting, and it will be a empty practice for us. We continue with Jesus's words, truly I tell you, they have their reward. Jesus concludes his warning to us by telling us that when we fast to be seen and appreciated by people, in other words, we, we fast with a human-facing heart, as Israel did, the pursuit of our fasting is corrupted by our hypocrisy, and our voice will not be heard on high. The rewards of fasting, which are to have your voice heard, to find God and delight in him, are lost and replaced by human accolades and praise when we fast to be seen by others. Think about that. Isn't that a terrible trade? We trade off finding God we trade off having our heart delight in him and, and having our voice heard. We trade that just for the praise of others, the temporary praise of others. It's a horrible trade-off. So he's, he's warning us, don't do that. Verse 17, in Matthew 6, uh, verse 17. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So again, he says, but when you fast, and, and here your English translation actually supplies the word when. It's actually not in the text. Uh, this word is uh, used to translate the force of the present active verb for fasting. So the verb is in a form that has a certain degree of force and emphasis. And, and since we don't possess, possess that uh, form in our verbs in English, uh, we instead translate it using the word when to emphasize the point that Jesus is making. If you're his disciple, you should fast. Again, we see this point. Uh, and I want to emphasize this because in my experience, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, in my experience, fasting is something that was completely neglected. I was, in my early years of life, the church that I kind of grew up, or the churches that I grew up in, uh, neglected fasting. And I believe that's a big mistake. Uh, so we see this when Jesus was asked by uh other disciples, why, by the people, why his disciples did not fast. If you remember that, the, uh, the John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And in Mark 2, 18, it says, people came to him and said, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples don't fast? What was his answer? Was his answer Guys, fasting is legalistic. Fasting's outdated. Guys, you don't need to fast. Don't worry about it. That's not what he said. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while, he, while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast fast. Jesus very much expects fasting to be part of our uh, spiritual life. He goes on to say in Matthew 6, uh, 18, put oil on your head and wash your face. 
So Jesus, the, the point of this uh, clause is that Jesus is instructing his disciples to take precautions against the hypocrisy of fasting. This precaution prevented people from trying to show the uh, supposed piety of their fasting. That's what he's getting at. Do not put your inward struggles on display for others to see and applaud. Do not make yourself look sickly or appear bleak and desolate so that people will notice your fasting. All of this is where the hypocrisy of fasting takes place. But as I alluded to earlier, I want to take a moment to address one of the errors that I think uh, is involved when we interpret this text. I think oftentimes we interpret this text uh, to basically say that we need to make our fasting like a matter of top secret national security. We cannot let anyone know that we're fasting and we have to completely conceal that and completely hide it. I don't think that's actually what Jesus is getting at. And I think we'll see in a moment that by his own words, I do not think that's what he says. Consider for a moment, the gospel writers themselves record many of the times that Jesus fasted. He did indeed fast often. We see that throughout the record. So they knew when, uh, at least some of the times when he was fasting. He was able, uh, through his example and his teaching, to pass fasting on to his disciples. So it's my conviction, and you can weigh this as you, as you see uh, best, but it is my conviction that, uh, for example, children should know or see their parents fasting. They should see their parents obeying Christ. They should see that their parents take following Christ so seriously that they actually do what he says. And they should know why. They, parents should have conversations with their children and let them know, why is it that we do this crazy thing like not eating? Do you like to not eat? Well, no, you don't like to, you know? And you can have those conversations with them and you tell them why. In addition to that, I believe Christians should know that their mentors and leaders fast, and they should know why. Again, in my experience, uh, I grew up in the church without any examples of fasting. I actually never saw it. Well, I'll take that back. We had one time that we did fast um, when 9-11 happened. Our church called a fast uh, in response to what happened there. It was the only time I ever saw it, though. Um, when I learned about fasting, I learned from a mentor that I met later in college. Uh, so it wasn't really until into college that I was even introduced to the idea of fasting. And it really wasn't until much later uh, when this became something that I, I was convicted of. I need to practice this. You know, is it right, for example, for us to say that Christians should love their enemies. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. Christians should practice generosity. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. Christians probably should pray. We know that's in there, but don't worry about fasting. That one, he didn't really mean that. That was a uh, whenever, if you kind of want to do it, you can do it, but you don't need to. Is that the kind of attitude we should have with this? Th these were some of the thoughts that I had to wrestle through when I was first introduced that this is something that should be part of my life as a Christian, that it's not something that Jesus gave to just be filler content for his sermon. Over the years, as I have wrestled with this, and I want to make clear, I did have to wrestle through this theologically because I was raised with a conviction that, you know, these things were, you know, you tuck them away and, and, so I, I had to think through that in addition to the fact that nobody really wants to naturally fast. It's not fun to do. But my, my thinking on this began to mature. And so as I have reflected on what Jesus meant when he says this phrase, 
put oil on your head and wash your face. I've had to think through, how does that apply to our fasting? What exactly is that? Uh, you and I actually probably don't need to actually do this because we take showers. We have modern, um, you know, shampoo and things like that. We have face washes. So this really isn't something that most likely we're going to encounter uh, very much. It's not a main issue. But there are steps that we can take to try and diminish the obviousness of our fasting to avoid the hypocrisy. So to help explain this, I'm going to do my best. I want to just very briefly tell you what is fasting and what does it do to your body. Uh, I think this will help us understand once we know what our body is doing, uh, what kind of precautions can you take? so that your fasting isn't obvious, so that your fasting isn't ruined by hypocrisy. So briefly, fasting, very obviously, is when you deprive your body of food. And so your body exists in two states, just from a, uh, a, the point of view of your anatomy, your body exists in two states, fed and fasting. And you actually go through this cycle every day. So that's why, for example, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first meal you eat? Breakfast. You're breaking a fast. It's a short fast. So you can see that actually a fast can occur when you simply enter a state in your body where your body is now processing the food you ate and is not intaking new food. So fasting can occur when you do a, uh, a meal fast. You just skip a meal. You go down a meal or two meals. Fasting can occur when you do a day or a multi-day. All of these send your body into the process of fasting. Now, there are basically four steps uh, to the process of fasting, and I'll try to go through this uh, quickly. Some of you may not be interested in the uh, physiology of fasting personally because I'm going through kind of a, a health journey on my own. This is something that's been interesting to me, uh, so I've been studying it. But the first step is that when you fast, your insulin levels drop, and insulin is the hormone that's responsible for energy management. When you eat your food, insulin tells you to burn that energy and to uh, uptake it into storage or fat. When your insulin levels drop, the signals to your body start burning stored energy. Now, through this process, this stage, your body may actually send uh, a, uh, the hunger hormone, and I can never pronounce it. I think it's ghrelin is the, the name of it. And this is what produces Jesus, what he says, the disfigured face. When you start having the hunger pains, and this comes in, you know, you have that temptation to start trying to disfigure your face and, and look, oh, I'm hurting uh, to signal what's going on. Um, this is your body beginning to burn that uh, energy. As well, glycogen, which is stored uh, in your liver, it's glucose that is stored in your liver. That's your first energy reserve. And you have about 24 hours of energy reserve just in your liver, which is really amazing. And so you start to burn that. Once you've gone through that, uh, fat is your next energy reserve and you start to go into your fat reserves. The next stage after you've gone through your glycogen is what's called uh, gluconeogenesis, which I probably butchered that. Um, but this stage is when your body needs to produce its own energy, okay? And so in this stage, you're going to have uh, kind of an uptick here where the liver produces glucose from your amino acids. Um, your blood sugars may fall, but they will stay somewhat stable. And so again, in this stage, you might start to have, uh, depending on your body, some struggle with... Uh, Maybe dizziness might be some struggle with your energy levels uh, during this stage. Um, you know, so you can mitigate one thing that we have done in practicing this uh, is we drink the uh, bone broth. 
bone broth has no carbs. It really has none of that, but it replenishes some of the uh, minerals and things that you are losing during your fast. And it helps reduce the headache and things like that. It helps you look more normal and function more normally. I won't go into this too much, but the next two phases are ketosis and then a, a protein conservation phase. Ketosis is actually marked by higher energy because you're burning fat. You started breaking down your fat reserves uh, and your body's actually beginning to uh, get those ketones from your fat and it loves that. So it's, you know, increased clarity and things like that. Um, you know, so when I was growing up, every time I heard the sermon preached about Jesus fasting for, uh, for uh, what was it, 40 days, every sermon, they would always say, and, you know, something like, and he was hungry. That's an understatement. Actually, it's not. If he had the fat reserves, all he experienced was normal hunger pains. It was at this point of about 40 days that his body moved out of ketosis because it had burned through basically all of his energy reserves and it started sending that hunger hormone again. And that ghrelin made him feel hungry. And that wasn't actually an understatement. So this is how your body goes through fasting. These are some of the stages that you in, uh, encounter in fasting. So a lot of the hypocrisy uh, that Jesus talked about, the disfiguring your face and you know, uh, letting yourself get all run down, those actually occur in the beginning stages of fasting, when your body's transitioning through how it processes its energy. So uh, here are a couple uh, things that I would suggest that I think are good ways to help uh, mitigate the obviousness of what you're going through. In our modern setting, how do we practice what Jesus is saying? Number one, mentally prepare yourself for the various phases that you're going to go through. Know that at some point when you fast, your body is going to produce the hunger hormone and you're going to get the rumblies. Uh, be prepared for that because, by the way, if you push through that, after about 24 hours to 36 hours, your body gets the message and it kind of stops. It starts to make that transition. And once it makes that transition, that's over. Number two is stay hydrated so that your body can flush out toxins, but don't overhydrate. When I first started trying to practice this, um, I made this mistake. I was under the impression that we're supposed to drink, what is it, like two liters of water a day. Um, and, you know, that's what supposedly we're supposed to drink, and that's wrong. <laughs> but in doing that, when you're not eating, you're flushing out all of your body's minerals. And this produces horrible headaches. I've never had such bad headaches in my life. Uh, so when you're fasting, make sure you stay hydrated, maybe uh, one or two bottles of water, but don't over, uh, don't over hydrate. It'll, you're gonna make the disfigured face a lot more because you'll have your headaches. Um, and then number three, I mentioned, drink some bone broth, which helps supply those minerals. That's gonna uh, reduce some of those external signals. It'll also help your skin look better. Uh, I would say the bone broth is maybe a direct correlation to anointing your head with oil. I don't know about you, but I don't think we even have oil at home like that. Okay, now I could go on at length about this, but I know it's not everybody's passion, uh, <laughs> so I will make that sufficient. What is the purpose of this? Flat and simple, the purpose in this verse is to make sure that, that our practicing of fasting is towards God alone. Do not make your fasting obvious to everyone else to gain their approval. Now, verse 18, we come in. Verse 18, so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So we come here to this point. 
so that your fasting isn't obvious. The heart of hypocrisy that Jesus is guarding against here is one that makes fasting obvious to gain people's respect and their applause and their admiration. His solution to this error is not to erect laws of legalism by saying that we must keep our fasting top secret so that no one ever knows that we fast. Again, my uh, understanding of this, what I have taught and suggested here, I think we should teach by example our children. I think we should teach other Christians when we make disciples. This should be something that they are aware of and that we model and teach to others. Rather, his solution is to do exactly what Jesus said. Take steps to uh, obfuscate the more obvious signs of fasting so that you appear normal to others. Don't be a drama queen. That's what he's saying. Don't be a drama queen. Don't make this obvious and don't try to make your suffering apparent to everyone. This allows us to turn our fasting towards God alone. Now, here... This is what he says. Jesus says, you know, so don't make it obvious to others, but to your father who is in secret. Now, we want to look at some of the rewards of fasting. Why do we want to fast? What are some of the additional rewards uh, not already highlighted? So in Psalm 35, 13, we see one of the rewards, and we also see uh, a connection to fasting in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which is the fruits of the Spirit. So let's look at these two purposes. Psalm 35, 13. Yet when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer was genuine. Among the chief benefits to fasting when practiced before God alone, so we remove all the hypocrisy, is the ability for fasting to humble us in prayer. Fasting is a means that Christians and God's people have used basically since the beginning to humble themselves before God when they are seeking, when they need their voice to be heard, they humble themselves to bring them in alignment with God and to seek his nearness, to get their voice heard on high. This capacity uh, is very powerful because in fasting, we are denying our most essential urges and choosing God. This process is uniquely suitable to teaching us inward humility. Now, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit that you probably have memorized since you were children, there is one fruit of the Spirit that I think is connected to fasting. And it took me a long time to see this. But in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it reads this. But the fruit of the Spirit is, skip to the last attribute, self-control. Self-control is a fruit, an expression of the Spirit dwelling in us. And in fasting, we actually learn, if we are walking in the Spirit, to deny the urges of our body. And I will tell you this, that as I have done several fasts, you know that there, there's something unique that happens in your mind. You fixate on food. It's the most bizarre thing. When I have done longer fasts that go towards the 48 hour mark and beyond, your mind starts to obsess about food and it's ridiculous you know like you'll be sitting there to try to you know prepare a lesson you're reading the bible and you're like and he was walking along the sea of galilee i sure wish i had a pizza and you're like what? wait a minute where'd that come from and your mind just constantly turns back to food and in that you have a choice 
you can try to handle that carnally, in other words, according to your own abilities, in which case you don't profit anything, or you can walk in the Spirit, and you can fix on Christ, and you can learn in the Spirit a, a measure of self-control. And I will tell you something. When I was younger, you know, I've shared here one of my biggest struggles, spiritual struggles, all the way from uh, basically the beginning of adolescence into college was an addiction to pornography. And I have prayed when I was younger, I would pray and pray and pray, Lord, if, you know, the fruit of the spirit, self-control, give me self-control. As if God's like got a computer that he just said, okay, David, self-control, download. You know, that's not actually how that happens. And so I was praying for this. You know what? In fasting, I have learned a measure of self-control that astonishes me. There is something about the pursuit of God and the, the devotion to learning how to deny your urges and control your mind and, and all of those things where your mind goes that really does infuse self-control into your spirit. It is a very powerful thing that happens. You will learn how to control your tongue, your eyes, and your heart, and your body. You'll learn to control all of these things if you will persist in the Spirit in fasting. So there is a good reason why Jesus is teaching us that this should be a discipline all of us practice. It is vital to our spiritual life. Not only is it a means by which we do seek God, and I want to promise to you, in fasting, he says, if you are fasting correctly, in the correct character of fasting, you will experience the nearness of God. There have been some times in my life when, uh, during fasting, the peace, of Christ that surpasses your understanding was so tangible. And the joy that I experienced in the spirit was so tangible, it was almost unbelievable. He really does promise to respond to this. So let's go into our conclusion to this message. It's provided by Christ. And he says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. That is the promise. Now, the question is our faith. This last verse in verse 18, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. I've shown some of the rewards of fasting here. And the question is, do we believe that God will reward us? Now, let's conclude with Isaiah 58, 6 through 10. I told you that we would come back here. Uh, I didn't realize, I mean, I, I knew, but I forgot this was actually my conclusion. So uh, you had to mark it to the literal end of the sermon. Isaiah 58, 6 through 10. This provides the key to understanding Christian fasting. And, and if you allow me to uh, interject a little note here. There is a difference between Christian fasting and all other fasting. Recently, I've been, I've been practicing a health fast for my health. That's not inherently Christian fasting, okay? Uh, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, they fast as well. Jews today still fast, okay? There is an important difference between all of those fasts and what we practice, and this is it. Okay, Isaiah 58, 6 through 10. Isn't this the fast I chose? To break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke. What is he talking about here? To love justice. That's what the prophet said. To love justice. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and the homeless into your house, and to clothe the naked with, uh, when you see him? To practice generosity. When you see those in need, help them. 
and not to ignore your own flesh and blood. Don't abandon your family. Eight, then your light will appear like the dawn and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. At that time, when you call, the Lord will answer. When you cry out, he will say, here I am. If you get rid of the yoke among you, the finger pointing and the malicious speaking, and if you offer yourselves to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will be like noonday. Your fasting is irrelevant if these are not the things that you practice in your life. Fasting brings a life that is aligned with the desire of God to bear in seeking God. Fasting brings a life that is aligned with the, the heart of God to seeking his heart. Okay, so we align ourselves, we help the poor, we, uh, we set free the oppressed, we, we put off the finger pointing and the malicious speaking, the accusations, the strife and the slander. We put all these things away. But my friends, this is why I'm so concerned today when I look at the Christian landscape, how we're responding to the politics of our day. The slander, the accusation, the constant attack. These are not Christian virtues. These are things that are destroying our uh, pursuit of God. So I leave you with this uh, teaching, and I encourage you to fast, to begin to seek God. And I do have one encouragement, one request and encouragement. Any of you who are inclined to fast, who are willing to do so, um, I ask you to fast on behalf of this church. Fast and seek God for this church, for this church family. We need God's power. We need his direction. We need him to intervene. And so we need to be a prayerful body. We need to be a body that is in line with the character of God. So if you're going to take up this fasting, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Isaiah 58. Align your life with it and fast and seek God for us. We need this. We need his help because there is a world out here full of lost people who do not know Christ, who have no hope. And if you can imagine for a moment, what would it be like for your greatest hope to be the politicians in Washington right now? That would be dismal, would it not? That's the state of many people in this world. So please fast with me. Fast with this church. Seek God so that we may be able to reach this community and glorify his name. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll continue our worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ, our shepherd, has taught us the way to go. That he has taught us what it means to follow him. Now, Father, we, we pray and ask that your spirit would fill us that we would be able to practice and follow what Christ has taught us through the enablement of your grace by the Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we go throughout our weeks, that uh, we would be able to seek you diligently and that you would be found by us, that we might know your peace, might enter your presence boldly before the throne of grace, worship you, that we would know you and that you, the light of your testimony would shine brightly in our life. We pray and ask that you would accept our worship as it is in spirit and truth. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing uh, 945. Kneel at the cross. And, uh, 945. Kneel at the cross. Christ will make you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice.